Hi, Roger Oyama, um, third generation Japanese American, uh, born in Japan, raised in San Francisco. Um, what else do you want to know? <laughs> well, let's get into what are your ties, describe your ties to the Western Edition community. Um, uh, recently, I've been involved with the community organizations, Japanese American Citizens League, um, the center, uh, various Japanese cultural organizations that operate out of Japantown through the festival. And um, you said you grew up in San Francisco. Can you uh, describe more of your experiences about that? Yeah, we immigrated back to the United States. My parents are Nisei, second generation. We immigrated back from Japan in 1958. And so I was just a little eight years old and grew up in the outer Richmond. So we weren't living in the Western Edition, but we would have sort of regular visits to Japantown. So uh, being involved with church and judo class, that was my initial connection to the area. And what was it like growing up in the inner Richmond? Or was it inner or outer Richmond? Outer Richmond. Outer Richmond. Yeah. I think moving to the United States from Japan was the first time I was confronted with discrimination, racial discrimination, from day one in school. You know, and the outer Richmond district at that time was predominantly still a Caucasian neighborhood. And there were only very few Asian friends that I had, only two. But I was kind of hazed the first day of school. And they say, well, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm going to school here. You know, I just moved here from Japan. He says, well, you're supposed to be at another school. I said, no, I'm not. And a little confrontation ensued. And that was kind of my welcome to life in America. Welcome to America. <laughs> Right. Did you know English when you moved to to the U.S. when you were eight? I did. I uh, was fortunate enough to go to a bilingual school in Tokyo, Japan. So I grew up with both languages, but I didn't learn English until I was actually five. And Japanese was the predominant language in the home. So... These trips to Japantown, were they meaningful for you? Was it nice being able to connect to your Japanese heritage? Uh, that's an interesting question because for me, having grown up in Japan and being in a, a real, so-called real Japanese environment, uh, it was interesting to see this hybrid culture, you know, where there were a few... Um, Issei at that time, first generation people that were friends of family that still spoke Japanese. and But then I, I realized that the kids here were very American. You know, and I kind of straddled both cultures, so I had a little bit of both in me. So, interesting enough, I, th I think they always looked at me as kind of an outsider, even in class. Uh, I went to, I had, was immersed in Japanese school as well, you know, and that was easy for me because I was way ahead of those other kids. But I, I found that Japantown was kind of a closed community. I, I, I realized this more as I became older, but I realized that kids, you know, when I went to judo class that uh, they were all knew each other from the community and I was the outsider. So consequently, you know, on the mat, there was kind of a bigger kid that he would delight in beating me really badly <laughs> on the mat. You know, just as, it was kind of a, a process to see, you know, if I was, you know, could take it. But I never was really involved. I didn't, I didn't join the Boy Scout troop here. You know, there was a Cub Scout troop, but it was um, integrated Cub Scout troop. It wasn't the Japanese troop from three, there were three in Japantown. You know, from the Buddhist church, and we're from the Konko church, and we're from the Presbyterian church. But um, my parents really felt that it was more important for me to have a more well-rounded circle of friends. So they didn't force me to become integrated into the Japanese community here. And did you eventually become integrated um, at school where you got beat up uh, on your first day? Yeah, I think so. You know, and I actually got gotten a few fights for myself, and 
my parents got called to school, but you know, I was able to, I think, get overcome the discrimination and establish friendships. And you know, there's still always going to be people that are going to give you a hard time. I mean, there was through the years, all the way through high school, I've been, I encountered bullying, you know, on all different levels. But I managed to, you know, just kind of, you know, deal with it as it happened. Um, yeah, so I think I, I was happy that I had lots of different friends. And the more I grew up, I became older and kind of looked in back here at Japantown, I realized this was more of a sheltered community. And I felt fortunate. I had friends from all over the world, you know, and that was really my parents and saying that it's more important for you to have a much broader perspective of society. So it's important you have all different kinds of friends. Just curious, were mm. you able to take that big kid on, on the judo mat? Uh, no, he was a whole head taller than I was. He was probably about three years older than I was, and he was a much higher degree in his ranking. So he was kind of all the other kids. He kept all the other kids in life. And I think he felt that it was, he had taken upon himself to mete out discipline to those he felt who needed discipline, and particularly me. <laughs> so what brought you back to the Japanese American community where you weren't, where you didn't feel particularly welcomed mm. at first? Well, interesting, you know, it's, it's been kind of a long journey. Um, most of my adult life and professional life, I worked outside of this community. I worked overseas and I have friends in Latin America, I have friends in South Asia, friends in Europe, and I learned to speak, you know, several foreign languages. So the way to come back to Japantown was probably interesting. It was after the earthquake tsunami happened in 2011 it was kind of a large impetus because I jumped in to help the JCCC and C and when they had their huge uh, fund drive to accumulate funds, relief funds to send to Japan, I got plugged back in because I volunteered and did phone work and uh, we ran the phone banks. And so I went back to Japan after that. So this was 2011? This is 2011, right. And before, prior to that, I got involved with a couple of cultural groups sort of between Japanese, Japanese-American groups. There's one group called the Chonaikai, which in Japanese means sort of a, uh, a meetup to, of a group for people to discuss various topics. It was an attempt to bridge Japanese residents living here in the United States and Japanese-American community. So a couple of friends had started that. It's still going on. Uh, I think it's a really good forum for us to get together to kind of discuss our similarities and differences because you know we'll we'll never be exactly like each other and that's a given you know and i think to be um, nikkei or you know people a persons of ancestry, japanese ancestry settling here in the united states uh, we are in a unique hybrid culture so i think we shouldn't try to be completely japanese it's it's impossible you know just to be proud of who we are. So that whole sort of metamorphosis came about, I think, by amalgamation of all the things I've experienced in my life. And right now, I'm working on uh, organizing a conference that will be happening in September, the first time it's being held in the United States for, since 2001. It's the Pan American Nikkei Convention. So this will bring together people of our shared ancestry together for three days here in San Francisco. So we have a lot of people here do not know that the majority of Japanese immigrants now reside in Latin America. You know, there's two thirds of them there. There's also a significantly large population in Canada. And yeah, obviously you know about large population in Hawaii. So we are going to be showcasing um, our common North American legacy to share with our Latino um, um, colleagues. Very cool. Yes, and uh, we're happy that after much pursuit, we have Secretary Norman Mineta is going to be our keynote speaker. Wow, that's a so, huge undertaking. Yeah, yeah. So, can you tell us more about your experiences abroad? Uh, well, it started out actually, I was at San Francisco State. I'm a alumni of the 
time when San Francisco State, we all went on strike in 1968 to fight for the establishment of an ethnic studies department. And we won that victory, and we just celebrated that 50-year anniversary this past year. The thing that happened was, after, the, after that was closed, the university did not open for almost a year because there was a lot of um, logistical things that kept the clue closed. So I decided to, at that time, go on my own voyage of discovery. And so I bought a one-way ticket to uh, London, and then I started my journey was to be able to hitchhike all the way from London all the way to Japan. And I allocated six months to do that. Unfortunately, I got as far as the Middle East and I got a letter from the general delivery in Athens saying that I was being called up for the draft for Vietnam. So I had applied for conscientious objector status because I had worked with the Quakers and I worked in the anti-war movement since high school. You know, my mother was an activist. So my mom wrote in the letter, she says, well, they found out that, you know, you're not in school. And so let me become, uh, you know, become first A, one A, you know, category for the draft. So my journey was disrupted. I mean, I was on How the- How did they track you down? Uh, they sent a letter to my, my parents' house and my mom forwarded that letter to me by general delivery. And so technically I looked at the date of the letter and I had to be home in 30 days you know, to go to this, uh, what they call induction um, hearing. So prior to that, I had filed for conscientious objector status, and I had written a, 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 probably my best academic paper as to the reason why I wanted to seek this status. So I had prepared that. So I went before the draft board to present this, this paper, you know, that I had written. And much to my disappointment, there is four selective service individuals sitting behind this counter, like kind of like a jury, and only one looked up at me. And I said, well, I'm here to present my case for status, just conscious objector status. And I started to speak and started, <laughs> I was like five minutes into my presentation, which would have been about a 20 minute presentation. And they told me that was, that's enough. I said, excuse me, I'm not finished. He says, no, we're, we're finished with you. I said, you're done. And I walked out a little disappointed. And after that, I was, they had rejected that status. So I became 1A again. I became 1A was the category for, you know, you're eligible for the draft. So finally, I came all the way back and had to go for my induction physical. And it was the Army Induction Center in Oakland. And I said, okay, this is it, you know. Um, and I was, met one guy, he was, <laughs> he had just gone out and smoked a bunch of weed. And he says, look at this, just, if you just act crazy, you're going to be able to get a discharge for being out of your mind. I said, nah, I can't really do that. But so I went through the physical and they do the whole thing. And I had had really bad um, allergies when I was a kid. And so I had to divulge that during the examination. And it was a real fluke. I actually got out on a medical discharge. I was rejected because of the allergies, but I was so upset because I didn't get the deferment because of the political thing that I was fighting for. So then I, I left and you know, then I came back and I said, well, I wish I could have just stayed on my trip. So I came, went back, to, we went back to school and worked at City Lights Bookstore for many years. And Finally, re-entered school, got my BFA uh, through the San Francisco Art Institute, you know, because I was out of my minor in cultural anthropology from San Francisco State, which I never finished. So I finished with a BFA. And then kind of fast forward, uh, and I went back to Japan in the early 70s to try to see if I could live there, you know. And so I did an independent study and worked and did a photo documentary project and lived there for almost three years. But after- Did you get your BFA in film? Uh, uh, in photography. photography. Yeah. But what happened was I realized I was too American. 
you know, I mean, it was a great experience. I made great friends in that time in Japan, but I decided to come back home. So I came back home and, you know, was, was broke. So I said, well, what am I going to do now? <laughs> so I ended up uh, just getting some kind of uh, menial sales job while I tried to decide what I was going to do with my life. And then in the process, um, I kind of stumbled into the travel industry. And within the travel industry, I started moving in with groups of people. But it started in tourism, but in the mid 80s, we're kind of going into that. I don't want to tell you all the details, but I was contacted by a Japanese company, tour company, that says, if you speak Japanese, uh, we need you to accompany Japanese businessmen going to Latin America. Because at that time, I just started to learn how to speak Spanish, right? So this is pre-internet days, so, you know, communications were quite cumbersome. There was, I think it was a telex, you know, and then long-distance phone calls. And so I would meet Japanese businessmen in Los Angeles, pick them up, fly down to Mexico, and then we'd jump on... Uh, land transport and then this is just when Japan the bubble was pretty up in its crescendo with the Japanese economy so they started to invest in Mexico for starters so there were automobile uh, petrochemical and electronics companies so those were the people I would accompany into Latin America so that develop my language skills, but also my organizational capabilities and working in that industry, and I really enjoyed it. So that kind of carried on, and then it went back into tourism and academic travel, and I was able to go to Europe, I was able to go to Asia, South America, and work for companies that we were basically taking sort of um, graduates of Ivy League universities. So these were really, these are the kind of tours that are people paying ten to $12,000 to go on. So they were academic study tours. So I was the tour organizer. I was basically taking care of all the logistics, but I was afforded to be on the tour, taking the lectures. And it was amazing, you know, to, for me to be able to go on these things. So they really broadened my horizons further. And by that time, I had became proficient also in speaking French. So that was another plus. So all these experiences and then traveling on my own, on my own free time, have really given me an amazing perspective of what the world is about and actually who I am and what my sort of, you know, emotional index is, <laughs> if you want to call it that, you know, and reacting to things and how I look at things through many different lenses as opposed to a singular lens. So I think that also people kind of sense that and that they kind of not sure how to categorize the how I think, but I, but I said, well, why, why do you want to do that anyway, <laughs> you know? I mean, it's, I think we're, I mean, we're all unique individuals and I think having a broader perspective is so important, and especially in this time in life, you know. Have you always had a good sense of your identity? Um, I have. I think I can't say that I'm singularly, uh, by you know, anthropological definition, I'm I'm Asian. I'm Japanese. You know, genetically based human being. But in terms of my values and my interests and my character, I'm probably an amalgamation of everywhere I've been in the world and everybody whom I've encountered in life. They've all left a little imprint inside of me, you know, in terms of things that I like, you know, the type of music that I like, the type of art, you know, the type of books I read, everything. So I'm grateful to all those travels and all the people that I've met that have really made me who I am today. And what brought you back to San Francisco, of all places in the world? Um, well, I actually bought a, I bought a house here 40 years ago, a little tiny house. You know, it's a post-earthquake. I found it, my house is, was built in 1908, way out, by Lincoln Park. And it was probably the most sensible financial decision I made in my life. God forbid I made many bad ones. 
But I've always been based here, and I've always, always came back here, and it was sort of my solace, you know, to have this little cottage that's off the street, that's very quiet, and have a view of the whole city. So, I mean, where else would I want to live, right? I considered living other places, I, like I told you, in Japan. I have friends in Hawaii, but I like Hawaii a lot, but I find it a little too limiting, you know, to my interests. I like to go visit. I always like to go visit, but I, it's too tough to live there. It's really expensive, and there's just not work there, you know, for me to sustain myself. So, um, yeah, I'm back here, and I, I have a love-hate relationship with San Francisco because I remember when it, what it used to be like when we first came. You know, I know I'm not too sure I really like it how it's become. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm conflicted at times, you know. I'm, that's why it's good for me to get away from it. But then when I get away from it, I kind of appreciate it for what it is, you know. What was it like before? How would you describe it? I think I remember San Francisco being more civil, you know. I remember when people were nice to nicer to each other and people weren't as aggressive, you know, driving like maniacs. Mm -hmm. And um, I think... Probably the late, yeah, eight, late eighties into the early nineties was kind of a pivotal point. I kind of noticed, you know, because socially, I kind of ran with a group of people that were from all over the world, you know, and there was there was just this nice flow between ethnicities. It's not as secularized as it is now, you know, and I think that was such a great time for the city. You know, we were like the little United Nations. A group of 40 of us, you know, and we always socialized with each other. And we shared each other things from each other's cultures. We celebrated each other's holidays. And it was fantastic, you know, and that's kind of, it's still there, but I see lines of demarcation, you know, in socially in the city now. I mean, I, I go to Asian events, but then I said, well, some of these Asians, I got, you guys don't invite anybody else. You just hang out with the, all, only, all your own kind all the time. It's not good, you know. I mean, you have to have a little, uh, you know, shared perspective in life, right? And, you know, I'm all for, you know, identity and pride and all this. I mean, of course it's important too, but I think there's a richness in crossing over and sharing and have different people of your life. It's just like, you know, if all your friends agreed with everything that you thought, it would be really boring. How would you have conversations if you didn't have disagreements about things, right? So... Yeah, that's uh, that's kind of yeah my love hate with this city, you know, and I I think morphing into your I guess your last question of talking about where I like to see this city become is I would I would like the city to somehow find its moral compass again, you know, and I think there's pressing issues where we're overcrowded. I mean the homeless issue I don't have the solutions for that, but. You know, intolerance and, you know, having half-baked solutions and halfway houses is not really digging deep into why, you know, the people are in their, in their plight, you know. So hopefully they're going to dig deeper and find some meaningful solutions to this because it's, it's only going to get bigger before it gets solved. And lastly, what are your hopes and dreams for yourself? Well, hopes and dreams for myself is... Uh, I want to have more time to write and do creative pursuits instead of just working all the time. I, I'm still working in my age because I did not financially plan my life very well. But you know, it, you is, it is what it is, huh? You bought a house. Uh, luckily, that like I said, I bought it you know back 40 years ago, and so that's my that's my security right now. But I enjoy working. And what kind of work do you do? I'm a builder. A carpenter, yeah, and also I also want to do more artistic type of endeavors and working with uh, working with wood and bamboo. You know, it's going to be my winter thing. I do do craft work every winter for Japanese New Year's, but I just um, this is a really tough year right now because I've taken this project on to produce this produce this event for September, and. Right. That's all I'm focusing right now because we're under the gun, you know, to create a workable budget and have funding to be able to execute. 
So that's going to be my focus until September for now. But that's after exciting. September, after September, hopefully I'll have my life back. <laughs> but it's going to be all worth it. Yes, yes, definitely. And uh, hopefully I'll send you information so you'll be able to attend. Thank you so much. Okay. Richie. All right.